Hey guys, welcome to the 36th episode of The Learning Podcast. And if you're unsure, it's a Singaporean podcast dedicated to learning something new from every single guest on this show. And today, the topic for this podcast is branding. And today, I have the privilege of meeting some friends on LinkedIn. Today's podcast is slightly different in the sense whereby the two guests. So the two guests I have today is the Branding Beardo. So I feel like this is a very exclusive brand because uh, exclusive uh, podcast because... <laughs> They have a podcast which is called The Branding Beardos. I myself, I don't have a beard, so I feel like I'm not really eligible to be part of this. Um, Big John and Kenneth, thanks so much for taking the time to join this podcast. Hey, hey thanks for having so us. happy to be here. A little context about Big John and Kenneth, right? They have their podcast dedicated to sharing branding insights for the Asian market. So one of the things that I think about on branding when I was back in business school is that it's usually meant for like big companies, MNCs. So where does branding really come in for SMEs? Uh, can SMEs can even do branding themselves? So these are the questions that I think will be interesting from uh, their point of view because I know that Big John and Kenneth has been in this industry for over 15 to 20 years. So they have worked with many clients in terms of, uh, of having that Asian context as well. So one thing is that perhaps most of the textbook they read is all like from the Western world uh, or the content that's coming from the Western world. So I think that there's really a lot of intricacies and nuances that can be discussed about in the Asian context. What is different about branding in the Asia compared to the Western world in that sense? So I think that this podcast will serve as a very preliminary introduction to branding as well as their stories. I'm sure they have a lot of stories to share and I'll be interested to learn from them as well. Other reasons is that podcasting, podcasting, I believe that they have just started the podcast together. So I believe that it hasn't been too many episodes, but I'm just interested in their thought process of doing this podcast together. And I think they are a testament that you don't need good quality, in a sense, don't need good quality to have a podcast because I feel that you can just have a conversation through Zoom, which is what Kenneth and John has been doing and they've been posting consistently online. And that's even how I got connected to them on LinkedIn by. So yeah, that's a pretty much most of the topics that we talk today. I think it'll be, Informal one, we'll just riff off each other and that's pretty much an introduction. Uh, Big John and Kenneth, can you give a, for the listeners that don't know who you are, could you give a quick introduction of who you guys are? Yeah, okay. Maybe I just start off uh, first. So Big John here. So I'm, a, I'm actually running a consulting firm, a brand, a brand <laughs> consulting firm. Um, and I work with a lot of SMEs and um, work on their branding, but I also deal with the MNCs as well when it comes to training. So training is both sites, both SMEs and MNCs as well that I, uh, I work with. Um, for me, this podcast, actually Kenneth and myself, we, we knew each other from like eight, eight nine years back. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah, and it was, it was before I, I went on my one year of self-discovery in Italy. So I lived in Italy for a year. We, we were actually colleagues for a very, very short while. And somehow we, we just continued... Uh, being in touch and then this year Kenneth got back from from the US and then we were we met up randomly for dinner one day before of course before COVID-19 uh, guys uh, don't anyhow call police on us and then yeah we hey we were like hey let's let's kind of start something we're like oh okay you know so we just and we thought you know we're so passionate and actually we we, we realized how passionate uh, each other you know it, how we both were so passionate about branding and then we started talking a lot, a lot. And we were like, hey, why don't we just do a podcast? So, you know, at first it was just very, mm, and, you know, we we're so busy, right? You know, I'm running a company and, and, and uh, for Kenneth also, he's such a busy guy, also lead uh, a business development and marketing site for, for his company. But, you know, one thing after another, and we, here we are, you know, after I think nine or 10 episodes already, right? I think so. Yeah, it's been 10 episodes actually. So very excited. Um, I actually... You know, for me, it's the journey is a little bit more of a, like a, I started out in the wrong industry and I actually got fired from my first job oh. and then I came back and I, I, re I reassessed myself and then I realized that actually I'm really, really into like helping companies grow and um, making it, helping them make a name for themselves. So I, I ended up in branding as a, like a, a very junior brand consultant. That's actually when uh, I met Big John and Ever since then, you know, I have been working with a lot of SMEs and a lot of MNCs. But my real passion lies in, you know, helping the little guys, the, the startups, the 
especially F&B startups, restaurant startups. I really love food and I also love the people that work behind food, you know, yeah. the ones that are in the kitchen, the ones that create. And so that's, uh, so that's my main, you know, thing. Uh, and to supplement that passion, actually, a lot of times um, in my day job, uh, I, I talk to a lot of chefs and a lot of, uh, a lot of people who work in the F&B business. I actually work on marketing and business development for a small uh, community mall in Singapore, uh, in Serangoon Gardens, uh, called My Village at Serangoon Gardens. And actually, I have been working on the brand for almost 10 years. Uh, it started my career. Uh, and then, you know, I was at the brand agency. And then after that, I went over to, to be the, the brand lead over there. So, yeah, that's my origin story. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot, I think there's a lot more things that we left out. Yeah, I'm sure we'll cover them, right? Let's say I, I'm just imagining the person who's listening to this podcast, right? Assuming that they have really no context about branding, right? Because I know the definitions of branding vary from like book to book, people to people, industry to industry. My my prior perception of branding is the is the definitions I got from a book by it's a book called Zach by Martin Neumeyer. So um, he his definition of a brand ah, is the okay. kind of feelings that are invoked within people or what people think about your brand instead of what you think of it to be. So maybe as a starting question, right, from yeah. your individual perspectives, right, what 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 is branding? What is the definition of branding? Okay, for me, for me, when I when I look at branding, for me, branding is a living, breathing entity. It is everything. It is your company, the soul of your company. It's supposed to drive your marketing. You know, it drives how you handle your people. It drives how your people think, how your people should perform, how you speak to your clients, how you handle your clients. It's everything. There is nothing like for me in a, in a branding process, there's not one thing that I don't want to look at. In fact, my clients, sometimes they, they, they ask me, wow, you look at so many things. Uh, our finances also, you must look at. I say, of course. Then if you are trying to say that, okay, you could be a small, uh, let's, for example, uh, Ahwat shop in the corner. But then the vision for your company, I want to be like Elon Musk, right? I want to send rockets to, to space. So I'll ask you, okay, Ahwat, what, <laughs> tell me what do you have, right? Can you reach now? How far are you? When do you start this dream? How far are you away from that? So so for me, right, it's, 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 it's really it's everything it's, it's driving it's supposed to drive everything and nothing you nothing that you do uh, is considered inconsequential to your brand every single thing you know where you invest how you invest for the future what are you putting into your people now you know um, but singapore's context right is that branding is is too much on the outside because the 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 link with marketing is so strong because brand and marketing so it's like oh Mm. Okay, so when sometimes when people they send me inquiries, oh, I, I need uh, I'm, I need a quotation for some brochures, then I'll be like, um, uh, I think this might be <laughs> wrong. Way. I can I can help you as the consequence of the the whole project, but I'm telling you now that we are not some random uh, design house or whatever that churns out uh, this kind of brochures. I say if you are really looking for that and and you are looking to pay that kind of price, then let me just go and refer you to the flyer distributors. You know, then you go and do that. Mm. For us, different because mm. for us, uh, from my standpoint, it's really strategy, and yeah? but of course not the kind of BS, bullshit strategy. I tell you, oh, look and do a nice vision mission, and then yeah, everyone clap hands together, and that kind of things is not that kind of nonsense. I really look, and we are really trying to make your yeah. business improve in every aspect uh, as much as possible. Yeah, for me, it's this uh, For me, it's it's everything. <laughs> it's everything. Yeah, I think John sort of like takes quite a bit of the words out of my mouth. My, my, my thought process is that brand is about like how you behave as an organization to each other, right? As well as to people who interact with your organization. With, but for me, it's with the end goal of leaving a positive impact on the people that you interact with within and without. And I think for me, what I be began to realize as I started out on my journey was that like initially it was always talking about, there were, it was always people talking about logo, you know, what color you should choose and all that nonsense, <laughs> right? But, but at the end of the day, like the logo doesn't represent anything at all. 
unless you attach meaning to it. So it's really about attaching a meaning, giving people a purpose both within and without uh, when it comes to like the company. Yeah. Yeah. You know, me, me and Kenneth, now we like to ask, uh, now we use this question no, to the companies. Why do you deserve? Why do you think you deserve to Why do you deserve to exist? Yeah. And I think if you can really answer that question deeply, you will be able to find the brand. The brand needs to have a purpose that exists beyond making money. Mm. Um, my personal, for example, when I work with my village at Serengu Garden, my personal take on the brand is that the brand must exist to serve the community and to bring happiness to the community, right? To be a second home to people, the place in between their work and their home. So everything I do spawns from that objective because it's very purpose like that way. Um, and it's the same for like restaurants that I work with, right? A lot of times when I sit down and talk to restaurant owners, I ask them, so what's your primary objective? Their primary objective is actually at the end of the day to make money. Mm. And then that's when I decide to walk away because I don't believe fundamentally and I don't work with, with uh, restaurants whose primary goal is to simply make profit. Mm. It has to be that the profit comes as a benefit of the purpose of opening this restaurant. And the purpose of opening this restaurant might be I'm trying to fulfill a dream. Yes. You know, I work for restaurants all my life. I'm trying to fulfill the dream of owning a restaurant. Mm. Or I want people to taste this dish that I've created myself. Or this, a twist to this cuisine. I want to affect uh, Italian food like no one else has done before. Then like those are the, the, the brand purpose mm. that I can give real meaning to. So that's how I approach it. Because branding, there's no, there's no special, I mean, the special source is that the, the founder of the brand is someone yeah. who, who is passionate about what he's doing and not that, oh yeah, I heard from someone that doing this business uh, were well, very lucrative, so I also do. Then to these people also, I say, I'm very difficult for me to help you because you're, you have, you've got your head stuck up your ass so far, I can't pull it out, <laughs> you know, and, and it, please stay there. You know, so this I, reminds I really me of, of you. and this reminds me of this like crazy ad that I saw on on YouTube recently, right? And I think it was like for job shipping, like, for Amazon job shipping, right? And the two guys, right? It's a local business. You can you can like cut this out if, if it's inappropriate. But these two guys literally said, "You don't need to have an original idea." And then I was right yelling at the ad. I was screaming at what the f are you teaching people? that you're running, you, you can run a business without having an original idea. Like what are you trying to do? Yeah. You know? no, but this is, this, is a, this is a problem. I'm so sorry. Maybe you have some other questions, but then this is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> No, actually on this, I think it's a very interesting topic because I, I myself, because I'm a yeah. digital marketer as well, I run ads for businesses, for big companies as well. And when I see mm. all these kind of digital ads about, about taking advantage of a new business opportunity yes. to take advantage of people's insecurity mm -hmm. when it comes to their nine to five or whatever. It just, it just fixates on an insecurity yes. that, okay, you can earn more money by doing that. And back to your point, you say right. at the end of brand, yes. the purpose of branding, right, is really not to make money in a sense. So I'm very interested in that aspect. I know that John has also talked about, about like walking away or is it kind of, kind of from walking away from clients that solely wants yeah, to make, walking away. make a profit. Uh, from yeah. businesses that only wants to make makes money, and that's that's my beef yeah. as well in that sense. Because, like for me as a as a digital marketer, right, I do I'm involved in selling products as well, whether it's telecommunication products, uh, pet products, mm. FMCG products, right. But when I see this kind of ads, right, I I I don't. The reason I personally why I don't do it because if I were to do it, the only reason would be that I want to make more money. And that's something that I feel that hasn't really mm. made mm. me drawn to it. And I feel like in, in a sense, it's uh, like an ethical yeah. thing. So like, if I were to ever have a conversation with these people who run the apps and sales, right, I'm just very curious of the success rate of let's say all these kind of Amazon dropshipping. I'm very interested in the success rate of all these kind of um, programs because I myself, if I would be mm. selling something, right, I need to be fully confident <laughs> that it will deliver the end yeah. product or desire that I've promised. 
and promising that everyone can right. make a full-time living from dropshipping, I wouldn't say that it's impossible. Mm. I'm not saying it's impossible. People do do it and people do make a large amount of yeah. money from it. But I dare say, or at least I don't have the evidence that has been presented to me that 90% of people who are doing this are successful. If they can do it, then... Mm by you but uh, and okay, I'm sorry I'm not over talking about this because I also feel very um, frustrated oh, but at the same time at the same time I'm yes. from, a, from a strategy paid marketing point of view right, I really respect what they're doing I mean I, okay, I, okay maybe respect is not, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Res, respect is not the word but think about this whole maybe I'll just go on a short rant right because I feel very passionate about this as well like from a paid marketing <laughs> yes. spend, from a paid marketing standpoint you're showing these kind of insecurity stabbing ads right through facebook through youtube and in paid marketing this thing called cpm cpm cost per thousand impressions how much does it cost to show my ad to 1000 people 1000 singaporeans and you can bet you can bet that out of this math of 1000 people right you can easily say that two to three people will sign up for that free webinar that will eventually be converted through right. their whole funnel and by math perspective right. right it makes sense because let's say if i'm paying ten dollars per cpm on youtube right and if two people sign up and if I can fill a classroom with 100 people and if I close 30 people at 3K, 4K each, mathematically, it makes sense. The reason why you are, we are seeing these ads, the reason why you are seeing these ads over and over again is because the ads are making money for them. They work. And they it's work. like a recurring cycle. I put $5 in, I'll get $5,000 back. And who wouldn't want that? I must mm, say, right. from a paid marketing standpoint, it's something that I really respect. But just that the, the ethicalness of what they're yeah. saying, I have a problem with yeah. that. I have a problem with that. I mean, I mean, it, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's something to do with, with, I mean, in any society, like, everyone wants the fastest way to wealth, the fastest way to success. That's why... Our people are very honestly, that's why we always fall into this kind of, 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 of things. Uh, I don't want to say yeah. any, <laughs> any other word, huh? but, but that's why we fall into this. But it's, it's the same thing with, with, with businesses. No? They go in and then they go and buy something and then they get 10 tips from whoever out there. And then they think that these 10 tips, right, were go, are go, is going to save their business. I said, look, tell me how difficult, and, and I actually did tell, ask a business owner this, tell me how difficult it was to set up your business. Very difficult, you know, not easy, right? Young men, and call me young men some more, right? And I say, yes. Then why did you think that 10 tips will save you, save your ass and save your business? It doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, it, it cannot happen like this if you're expecting. And, and that's why it's this quick returns thing that they, they, they want, right? And I mean, come at the end of the day, right? If, if everyone's going to be sending, selling the same thing also, let's be going to think our Amazon friends, for example, right? And then you have the same bunch of people selling the same thing. Then you tell me, uh, you know, then there's obviously too much supply and you think you'll be able to maintain that price. Come on, uh, you know, but people don't realize these kind of things, right? But yeah, I, 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 yeah. I appreciate that, that they, you know, they had the guards and I'm, I, uh, I mean, kudos to their success and everything, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll clap my hand, I'll clap my feet for you guys. But, but it's, it's, I, I find that it's just, you're, you're selling, you're selling people, you yeah. know, some, some hopes and dreams but that might never materialize because you forget you know you make it sound so easy but you forget about all the other things that go into the parts of being a businessman and an entrepreneur you know it, that, I mean that aside also even for someone being a, a leader in, in an organization is already tough enough but here you're trying to tell people that oh you can you can go and be a millionaire go look at my Lamborghini go look at my Ferrari mm -hmm. you know this is what you get when you sell stuff or sell shit on Amazon you go and buy cheap you know a few cents but I mean just just think about it you know um it's it's really going back and the cliche saying nothing comes easy right and always beware for me yeah, very simple beware of strangers bearing gifts my uh, my, my opinion my opinion is also like on a very real real sense right like show me a business right where you can have very short-term quick gains right but it's sustainable like 20 30 years sustainable if you look at like all the things that these guys are doing right um, it is the promise of quick gain, but it doesn't promise you a long-term stability. So the, the question is whether you want to trade your reputation for the quick gain or not, right? Because like you said, right? Like, let's say there, is a, there are 30 people that sign up for the class and each of them pay 3, 4K. And out of that, the success rate, even if it's, if it's one third, it's 10 people. Let's say it's 10 people that succeed and 20, 20 people that don't succeed. Then you have 20 people 
they are going to come back and tell you, hey, it didn't work. And tell other people, hey, it didn't work. So tell me, right, how sustainable is it? How, susta- how, many, of the, how many people are you going to fail, right, before you eventually destroy your reputation? Yeah. I'm also I sure think, the, the yeah. couple of guys there also, they, I mean, the money they have made, and I'm very, very sure they were very smart with their money also. Yeah. So that's the part of the story that they're leaving out, not just this right. thing here, you know, which will get you the few extra bucks in your pocket, but it's really right. building a sustainable uh, business model for themselves, you know. And the other thing, interesting thing is that, like, I was talking to my wife, but, and she told me something. She said, it is so lucrative, it is so good, right? Wouldn't they be doing it themselves? They won't be teaching you how to do it already. Right? It's probably done, done deal already. Now they're just getting more suckers in the system. You can cut that out if you want also. But it's true, right? Like in my opinion, that's, that's how I view it. Uh. You know, but then I have actually honestly have nothing against guys who want to be first, go in, draw all the money out and, and walk. Like I don't, I'm not against that. Uh, but I think that the moment you start to lead other people into it without knowing the consequences of it, uh, that's when it's, it gets dicey. Like you said, it becomes ethical for me. You know, it's like, it's like uh, what I've been seeing lately. Wow, $20 uh, can become a life coach. Honestly, you're going to trust <laughs> your life or with someone who yeah. you know, you know, paid 20 bucks for his life coach certification. You know, is, is, is this kind of thing. You know, because right now, uh, you know, everything online so it's easy. Right, so I was, yeah, uh, and and it, it's crazy that the amount of people who, who who I mean, it's very easy. I mean, anyone can can talk, right? That's the thing. Everyone has the ability to talk through a true sharing of life experiences. You can make an impact on someone. That is for sure. For me and Kenneth, it's always very simple. When we started this podcast, let's I said let, let's let's look at it. Let's no BS, no nonsense from us, right? Cut out all the crap, and we focus on experiences. So everything that we've shared through our few episodes have always been. Interactions with clients, interactions with mm. people, uh, experiences mm. from the projects that we've done, and nothing out of the ordinary that we don't do. Because the best way forward is to listen to someone else's experiences. You know, the thing is, everyone also needs validation at the same time. So that's why they go for this twenty dollar kind mm. of uh, life coaching. But for me, that is, I, I, I have to use the. Well, cut me if it's, I shouldn't be using it, but for me, it's a bit of a scam, la, you know? Like $20, $20 for a life coaching cert. I mean, so, seriously. So it's, it's interesting because I, the examples that John mentioned and the example that you mentioned and the examples that I mentioned, I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's, it's, it's preying on people's insecurities. And the insecurities that we have created as a, as a society, right? Like the way we approach uh, what is enough money? What is enough status? Uh, we the way we measure like how your wealth is based on like the size of your. Uh, in fact, even even the amount of government aid you get is based on the on the size of your house. Correct, because apparently your house determines your net worth, and that's like kind of an odd thing for me. You because you can be living in a big house but not be cash rich at all, and so like my opinion is that like if we view it as symptomatic of our society, right? Then it's something that we really have to re-examine ourselves really like, and ask ourselves, what is enough? Like, what am I going to be content with? If we can do that more often, right? It's a lot harder for these guys to prey on you. It's a lot harder for these guys to like exploit your insecurity. I think it's the same like slimming, slimming products or slimming ads, or, right? <laughs> the only reason, or like, you know, there was this one point where there was this, um, uh, beauty service like, make your boobs like larger or whatever right and they guarantee like <laughs> size remember and it's like running the ads and I actually did take a photo of that and, 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 I, and I shared it and I said like this is ridiculous because it really is preying on like people's insecurity mm. you know and, and it's harmful it's harmful to the person that takes it it's harmful to, to society when we accept it and I think if we just question why our insecurities exist, a lot of these, a lot of these companies will go bankrupt. Sometimes I don't yeah. know whether it's like a chicken egg problem. Like I mean, at least for me, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I know friends that during this COVID nineteen, not 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 to say my friends are the ones that goes for these um, workshops or anything, but 
insecurity is a real thing like, in a sense whereby I have a friends that really have no cash flow there, 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 there's no business coming in in a sense and, uh-huh. and when you talk about I like how you talk about the, it's symptomatic as a society so let's say if um, from your perspective in assumption that you or every one of us could take a little action towards uh, reversing this symptomatic uh, negative trait of a society, right? I mean, I, this is like very macro talk already and it reminds me of the podcast which I had with uh, Mr. Zanus, yeah, one, one of the one, one of, uh, members of parliament. Uh, and I, I even dare to say on this podcast, right, that he was even more Candorous. He was so direct after the podcast, not during the podcast, but yeah. one, um, yeah. maybe a common topic that I can start off with is that, let's say, one thing that I talked to him after the podcast is that I feel that someone on, okay, I'm not to get political here already, oh my gosh, but like, you talk about Gary Vaynerchuk <laughs> as a, you talk about Gary Vaynerchuk as a, as a entrepreneur from the United States all the way, preaching all these kind of values about not being insecure, about, about being empathetic, about being kind, right? I feel that there's no yeah. person there's no Singaporean figure that is able to do that at a Singapore-ish level or in a, because let's say, let's say you talk to this yeah. like mid thirties or, or let's say the mid mid thirties, uh, 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 male, right. Who, who the, the chances of him, let's say resonating with a person like Gary Vaynerchuk or perhaps someone resonating with you, Kenneth, I would say, I'll even argue that Kenneth would be more uh, suited to be an individual to resonate uh, if he were to be like m- marketing this macro concept of not being insecure in the first place. So, they, okay, honestly, this is a little bit too deep for me. I'm also not very sure on to these kind of topics, lah, but at least for Big John, like from your perspective, oh, right? It's, it's like pretty interesting. I, 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 at the same time, I feel empathetic towards people who sign up myself because it's really a difficult time. And on the side of yeah. me knowing yeah. the scale of Facebook advertising, Google advertising as well, I, I feel that a lot of businesses out there aren't taking advantage of it. So recently, I uh, not to rant mm. again, right? Yeah. I have another guest that came in. He was like a 19-year-old and he's running, he's running ads. So how he got into this um, system of paid marketing right was that he he signed up for one of these courses as well about like like uh, oh you should get a, get a better life all that kind of stuff and he really <laughs> i would say in a sense it is successful because he has taken an initiative in that sense mm-hmm. and i feel that there is there might be some kind of useful materials that are from this workshop as well because i really cannot say i haven't been in them i'm only inferring from the ads that are outside i'm only inferring from the kind of comments that are online i think there's one mm-hmm. yeah, so Okay, I know I'm like talking over the place, right? But in terms of your POVs, in terms of ch- the chicken egg problem, right? Where, where do we start mm. with this big topic? Okay, so I think like, I, allow me to jump in a little bit because I, I think that you're not over the place. In fact, like you're actually talking about one issue, but there are just many, many like facets to that issue. And one of the things that I was talking to uh one of our guests offline, uh, just like checking on WhatsApp with Carrie, right? Uh, Carrie Sim, who works at Circles Life. We were talking about like how um, the way that we view things is really a little bit of a brainwashing or of a, of a training. So like people will go, will tell university students, you need internships. So they'll just go and look for internships. But then that is the form right in like philosophy or like critical thing we talk about the form the structure and then the substance so the form might be correct like oh you need to go and get internship but the substance of why you need internships right if you change the form people cannot apply the substance so like think of all this right why do you need internship you need internship because you need experience. You need experience because you need to operate in, you need to be able to op- op- operate in the real world, in the living business. But a lot of people don't get it. So they think I need, in ex- I need internship experience to put my resume. So that like, when I go to big four, right? Ernst and Young will hire me. <laughs> Correct? All right, because I got, I got industry experience huh? at like a bigger company. Fact of the matter is, if you remove the social structure and you look at the, the cloud, the, the sort of gray misty cloud that in reality is a uh, working experience to operate in the real world. Then I think you can go to like any place, be very hyper involved, take that experience out and then transfer it into like 
a bigger or a scale up kind of a location. So it's the substance, but like the substance needs a container. And that's how I view it. Then what is the substance in this case? So in our case, right, the substance is understanding that you need first skills. Then you need to be able to relate to human beings mm. on a very personal level. Then you need to be able to relate on a larger scale to human beings and understand that a lot of people don't care about how, like they don't care about you and they don't care about how they make you feel. And that's okay. And I think then and only then are you able to sort of adapt and change and be able to communicate. And that's why like, if you look at the way Big John and I operate, right? We know you don't care about how, what you say. Uh, we, know, we, we know that you don't care about what we say because not everybody will. And it's okay. We will only talk. We only want people who care about you listen to listen and have a conversation with us. And then and only then can we do bigger and better things because you understand me, I understand you. And then we can affect the rest that don't understand. And that's fine. That's, that's my opinion. I don't know about what John has to say about <laughs> Oh, if anything about taking the words out of my mouth, I think that was straight, that was taken. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for, for me, looking at, at everything, I think also, I think it's just in human nature. So I don't think there is a chicken and egg situation. This is just inherent in human nature to, you know, one thing we want to better ourselves, you know, we want to be paid for what we are passionate at. We want to be paid for what we think we are good at. But Kenneth brought up a good point about the skills and all this, you know, we, for us, it's not like, hey, overnight and then we call ourselves consultants, you know, it was through a lot of ass kicking, you know, we went through uh, throughout the years. For me, I started my career in, in advertising. So I saw that side of the business and then I was slowly, you know, put in to, to do consulting work. And that was a lot of, after years, you know, and of course there are a lot of moments as well that you, you have to justify why you're saying and doing certain things to, to people, to your, your, your clients and all that. And through that, you really need to show the skill, you know? And, and that's why I mentioned the part about why I was so disturbed by all those, you know, um, courses that they're selling, I mean, those life coach courses. And I didn't bring up others. The life coach one bothered me the most. Because here you are trying to, to impact another on, on, upon another person's life. And the wrong thing that you say could lead them down to a very wrong path. So for me, morally, I find that it's, it's the worst. For me, uh, that's the worst thing. It's not like you go and pay 20 bucks and go and download a whole bunch of material, how to be a good photographer. That one, I myself would go and do it. It's completely okay for me. But when it goes down to human in- interaction, that this is where, you know, where, where you cannot depend on people's good judgment, right? To make the decision. This is for you as the person who's providing this thing, whether you have the moral judgment to want to put this out there to people because technically what you're doing is not illegal. And if any person pays you that money, right? In order to, to learn this from you, then it becomes their fault. But the, the moral question should be put on that person who is selling this. Are you qualifying these people correctly? The way you make it sound is so simple, but number one, life is not that simple, you know? But here you are trying to tell everyone that anyone can become a life coach. And again, telling everyone out there that it's okay. Once these people are certified with my $20 certificate, you can trust them with your life. Is that, is that, the, rhetoric, is that the, the thing that we are trying to tell people? So for me, it's, a, it's really a, a, a moral issue. And of course, the skills. You know, I know people who spend you know, uh, easily five, very high five figures to go for proper coaching courses, which take them years to get, you know, and at the same time, they supplement that with psychology papers and, and a lot of business experience. You know, you've got to have life experiences yourself first, apart from skill, huh? right? Mm-hmm. You need the life experiences yourself to be able to come to that point where you can call yourself a life coach. You know, how can you go and, you know, for example, you, it, this is where maybe the gray hair a little bit will help, lah, you know, in some sense or graying beard, right? And you know that, okay, this person is really telling me from experience and that's the same approach that me and Kenneth are, are taking. We're not selling you snake oil, you know, we're not selling you please go and walk on coal, hot coals and then, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in the green, you know, and, and you know, we're not doing that kind of thing but we're really sharing with you experiences. Look, if you, experience, and, and one thing about experience is this, you can, you want to listen, some people will listen, fine, but for those who don't see any value in it and think that the experiences are BS or whatever, then yeah, that's okay, we can't win everyone but for me, 
it's 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 the the, the morals are the, the the important bit, and this ability to bring forth not only skill but 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 experience. If you are short on experience, then you better be high in a lot of skill. You know, which I think, uh, especially if we are translating it to a career point like digital marketing, for example, that one is a lot a lot of skill. It's needed a lot of knowledge. It's needed at its very core already, and that one is different. You, you don't really necessarily need the 10, 20 years of experience for someone to be able to trust you. It's really at that. And the moment, I think for, for you, you also, it's the same thing, you know? And that's being, uh, so, I mean, it depends on the, on the industry um, as well. Uh, but um, yeah, for me, this, this topic is uh, <laughs> it's quite a, because I've met, I've met many snake charmers and I get very, very pissed off over this kind of thing because it's like, yeah. Are you really? Are you am I really hearing this correctly? Are you trying to tell me that if yeah. I go for your course, uh, I can, well, I can have out of body experiences? I say, wow, oh, you know, for me that's really disturbing already. And I, for me, I will call out these people. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's really interesting because that you that and you you know John mentioned about this because in my in my opinion, even branding, right? You require a lot of sort of going through branding two, three, four, five, you know, and then companies and then being involved in that process, right? And part of that is the marketing, part of that is the PR, part of that is the the design and thinking about it as a whole and building a strategy around the core purpose. And I think in like, to, to juxtapose it to the opposite, right? In digital marketing, if you put it in an opposing point of view, the good thing is that you can like ultra compress uh, years of lessons right into months because you can do an experiment every day on your own channel, on your own work, right? And, and you can like really like 10, 10 X your learning. Uh, but when you're fiddling with other people, once you start fiddling with other people's brands and other people's lives, then you can't anymore. Mm. And that's the one thing I learned, right? Like, there was there was somebody who and i i guess uh this is like a client experience right i said we may have to do some testing we may have to like ask uh, try out you know different versions of an ad and this lady looked at me and in like mandarin said you think i'm a lab rat obviously this woman didn't understand digital, digital marketing like you know right but that in lies like the concern of like a business owner who isn't savvy. Mm. And there are many business owners who aren't digitally savvy and they don't understand what testing means. So, but you, if, if you are someone who has never worked on a brand with the SME before, you would be offended, right? Because you're thinking, here, I'm trying to help you. And I was offended. But on hindsight, when I look back at it, I'm like, I sound like, and this is the reflection. I sound like I am messing with your brand. I am, I am just doing experimentation with your brand. And I sound like I didn't care about your brand. And so like, to me, uh, brand building really does take a lot of like nuance. You have to be very careful. People are very conservative about their brands here. They hang on to what already exists within that sphere of control. And they kind of sort of try to avoid going, going out of their sphere of control. Uh, and I think one of the effective ways I found in building a brand is to work from within to push out the locus of control. Mm. Uh, so uh, my example would be, yeah, you want to do something that people will be familiar with first. So instead of going all the way out and taking a huge risk and doing, say, a concert at the venue that you manage, like a massive concert at the venue you manage. You start with doing night markets at the venue that you manage, which is then copied by other venues that are in competition with you. And then by the time you already, they, they copy, you're already thinking ahead. So you are scaffolding into the extreme situation. So SME or like smaller companies, that are not like maybe not ultra cash rich, but like are venturing into branding. They see it as ah, there's a success, there's a success. So you scaffold them into it, give them the confidence. Yeah. yeah. 
That's correct. One of the things as a brand consultant or even as like someone who, who manages and leads brand is that like if you don't get buy-in from senior management and and they are right to be fearful because there are so many brand mistakes that happen all the time. If you want to get confidence from them, you have to scaffold them into that. You, know, you can't just go, look, Pepsi, Coca-Cola are doing all this. We have to jump in. Like, they will tell you straight that like, we are not Pepsi, we are not Coca-Cola, we are not Capital Land, we are not you know, whoever. We are, we are a small company and we cannot take a beating, mm. basically. You know? And then you have to give them the confidence. No, but at the same time, I think from uh, dealing with these SMEs, right? When and one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this podcast and why it's starting to be like wow, a super passion for me is that too many of our local companies, too many of our even Malaysian companies, Asian companies, think so lowly of themselves. For me, it's so painful to hear a client, no la, we are not like Apple not like Amazon. We are not like the Angmo company, you know, not like the Western company. I said, look, for heaven's sake, do you know where the hell Apple started, right? In a little garage somewhere. And I really don't like uh, this mentality because China, like if you look at China, for example, the way that their brands, they are proud, you know, they are proud as a nation, proud as a people. And so the brands show it, you no. Know, and in terms of, okay, let's not go into the innovation, whether stolen or not stolen, <laughs> huh, but whatever, Whoa. we move away from that, right? <laughs> we move away from that 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 is not for us to debate. But the thing is that they are proud, and I I'm 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 so happy to see that there are great brands coming from there. I mean Alibaba with a very very charismatic leader, and then you look at that, then so if all the time and and I, I did tell this to an SME boss, then you see you look at China, you know Jack Ma right Alibaba all have right you know Tencent and all these all these companies big innovative companies coming out. So now you always talk about cannot lah I'm more company we're not like I'm more company. China is doing it, you no. Know? So what is it? Why? So my, 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 my wonder has always been, why do we think like that about ourselves? And it, and it holds us back. And, and it's like companies like Razor. Razor had to go somewhere else in, in order to be successful. You know? and this is the sad yeah. part. You yeah. know? And, and, and yeah. Yeah. I, want, I want this podcast to be, to be like telling the, those brands that look, if you take the right steps and if you are properly guided, right, you can hit, you know, might not be within the first generation of owners. But I mean, success is there for the taking. And I'm talking about long-term success, you know, not just pass on to your kids and then after that, after that fingers crossed, you know, that kind of thing. And there's always, there's always potential. And I like what Kenneth say about the part about uh, scaffolding and staging them because people always ask me, so I do your project, huh? then uh, how many percent my turnover can increase? I said, if anyone can tell you that and guarantee you a number, that person is lying because no one can guarantee you any kind of success like this. You know, for the clients who have, who, who have me, they follow my plans, things improve, that's for sure. But then there are other people, whether uh, external factors, you know, all the, all the other parts, you know, uh, political factors, whatever market issues and all that, you know, yeah, there could be other reasons why they don't succeed as much, but no one can give a guarantee on that. So for me, that's why I always say that the brand is, 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 is living and breathing. And for that means you have to nurture it at every, at yes. every stage as well. Same thing, Apple, all the big companies, they all nurtured, but all led by a very, very powerful and charismatic leader. And I don't think and that I, we are I, caught on those characters, you know? Yeah, and, and, and I think John brings up a very important point, right? Like, it's about like how personal and how much you care about what you're doing. It's, it's, you know, you, I always really believe that you have to tell, especially SMEs, right? You have to tell them, hey, you can do this. I, I, I often notice that he, he's right, uh, and John is right in the sense that like, a lot of SMEs in Singapore, even in Malaysia, in Asia, yes, there is a lack of confidence. It, it is, it's the whole, no lah, I, I just do the business, right? Make enough money, can I really? Let's, let's roll that way. Um, there is a lack of ambition but also at the same time, uh, I my gut sense is that there's conf, uh, there's a confidence issue because ninety percent of the time when I do the research, do the math, present it properly, and then look them in the eye and say, "Listen, you can do this." It happens. But the moment 
you know, the moment, and I, so I always put it as my fault, lah, okay? The moment I miss out on doing the math as well, right? Uh, the controllable math, right? There's math that you cannot control and there's math that you can control. The moment you don't control, you don't fulfill the things that you can control, um, there will be a lack of confidence. Yeah. And yeah, and then when that when that happens, nothing can be no no brand activity can be done. Uh, the other thing is also talking about like ROI, which brings us back to the whole. It's a short term thinking, right? If I do this, if I invest this twenty thousand, how much will I make back? Hmm. First of all, how would you know? But we know from taking these actions, other people taking these actions, these are the results, right? So based on that, what is your confidence level in your product, in your space? Then after that, we ask you again, why do you deserve to exist? Yes. So a lot of times, a lot of SME owners also, when they ask you, right, how much, what is the ROI, right? They are trying to project their insecurities on you. Yeah. So again, we go back and forth, right? But the ones that do understand branding, I am so glad that I work for, <laughs> I work for employers, shout out to my employers. I work, I work for an employer who understands like brand. And they are willing to like take the risk and they're willing to, they understand why brand is so important. And the moment you like work for people like that or you work with people like that, uh, it's, it, it really gives you a palpable sense of relief because then you're like, okay, when every time you try to explain something to them, they get it on a fundamental level. Whether or not they execute it is a different story, but they get it, they like it, you can discuss, and there is that compromise and middle ground. And a lot of times when you have that kind of partnership, it, it, it's really very helpful to the business, to the ground. That's not to say that there's no, not going to be conflict. There's not going to be uh, moments where you go, but I don't think this is, this is good for the brand. And the other party will say, I think this is fine for the brand. That's not to say that there's not going to be any conflict. But I think you can work it out very much quicker. Corey, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, I'm very interested in the topic of lack of confidence within uh, you would say SMEs within the Singaporean or Asian context. One 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 yeah. recent book that I've read is the Business of Expertise uh, by this guy called David C Baker. And one one thing that he talks about, right? He he feels that he is a terrible motivational speaker when it comes to let's say encouraging SMEs. Like you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Because no matter what, of course, it's this. That's exactly what you're saying, right? Um, he says he's like the worst motivational speaker on earth. But then he realized that there's another variable, right, that can reverse this insecurity in the companies in, in themselves and that variable right is the opportunity from the marketplace the moment they get tangible mm. results right from the market right they'll realize that hey what I'm doing let's say within branding right makes sense and there then it will go on from there so that's why he doesn't focus on 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 being an encouraging and motivational speaker but focusing on really bringing as much tangible results to their clients as much as possible although Branding is like a very um, like big thing, right? So I'm very interested from your experience, right? In terms of, let's say, reaching that, uh, giving more opportunities from the marketplace to your clients, right? In terms of the stories that you can tell of what kind of results have you seen in your experience that really elevated the confidence of your clients? So uh, I think like there are some levers that you can pull. One of the really good ways to do it is like, for example, there were, there were times when people will go, mm, influencer, PR, and marketing, you sure it'll work or not? And this was like 10 years ago when there were only bloggers and there was like, I think Instagram was only on the cusp of starting. And I went, well, if you get the right ones and you tell them the right thing, and you spend the right amount of time with them, it worked. And look at me and they look, they look at me like I'm crazy. I said, okay, i tell you what, let's do this once. And if you don't get the result that you want, you don't get the result that you like, or you don't get any result at all, you'll stop. So we went like really big and we, we, did, we invited, I think it had to be at that point, 50 followers 
they, they were still called bloggers, not influencers then, right? <laughs> 50 bloggers uh, uh, in, in a span of like three weeks, multiple sessions, right? And then when the blog post started to come out and people started, like faces that the, the, the businesses had never seen before started to show up, uh, I asked them, I said, just ask the customer, where do you know us from? Where do you know us from? Just, just open your mouth and ask. And I, I, I sat there and I watched one afternoon and they were like, oh, I, I read it from this blog. Oh, I read it from that blog. Oh, someone recommended me because they saw it on this food blog. And then they were like, shit, that's like 20% of our day. And I was like, dude, this is what I mean. If you don't try, you don't know, but you got to like, look at like what the potential is. So that really like triggered the level. Then, then everybody started to share about it to other business owners, right? And then it becomes, it becomes a thing. But again, I need to go back to the idea that we often fix it on the form and not the substance. So will be like, okay, we have to do like, now it's like a, a must do, right? We have to do like influencer marketing, influencer PR, whatever, right? But then when you look at the actual substance, right? It's really just fire and forget. Hmm. There, there is no continuity. Hmm. There's no consistency. There's no thinking about what goes beyond uh, the, the brand. There's, there's no thinking about what they will leave and say to other people. Hmm. There's no thought on that. Hmm. And, and that literally is my main gripe with influencer marketing. People go, it's not working. Like, why isn't it working? What kind of impression do you leave on that? How many times did you talk about the thing that you really wanted to talk about? How did you impress upon them that this really is different from everyone else in the market? And also, are you selling a shitty product? Because if you are, no amount of influencer marketing will, will save you. No amount. Right? And at the end of the day, and I'm going to sound really cruel saying this, I'm going to get a lot of backlash. <laughs> But the number of restaurants shutting down, a good number of them deserve it. Oh. A, a, coronavirus is the fucking reset button. It's the control out delete of Singapore's F&B industry. Many of you, and you know this, talking to the restaurant owners, too expensive, not good enough. You run too many overheads. And that's why you're shut. Many of you. It's a, it's a huge reset button. And I say this like as a food writer, going to many, many restaurants, often doing many tastings, as well as like paying for my own food. I can tell you that like a lot of restaurants are overpriced, under tasted, uh, and then they take away attention from the true hidden gems. And now it's a huge reset button. God, I'm gonna get in so much trouble for this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it's now. Now I read that disclaimer. Now, <laughs> the branding beardos does not represent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for so, me, like, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, maybe no, for yeah. tangible, tangible returns for for business. I think to even get to that point, I think it's so important that every business number one be very open about what someone has to tell you because the uh, the difference in your business improving and not improving could be many different things. There are some clients of mine who fixed an internal issue and they found themselves improving because less infighting, more concentration on the work of hand at the work uh, uh, on the work at hand and improve because of that performance raise client um, their client complaints went down significantly. You know, teams were operating better together. Some of them were like this. Some other clients, they needed more. How they treated their staff. So that was a revamp. Again, something more internal branding focus, a revamp on HR policy, revamp on hiring practices, revamp on all these things. Then allowed them to cut down because a lot of companies here in Singapore, they don't really know at the end of the day, right? Uh, the, the real numbers when it comes right to rehiring, hiring, they don't really keep a good uh, track of these things. But when they realize, when they sit down and they realize, oh shit, I'm actually spending a lot of money on training. And, and re rehiring all these people. So those things are fixed. 
business, definitely your numbers start to go up. I've seen clients who have, who have gone through that space as well. Some of the clients, yeah, it could be, okay, let's go take your first few steps into digital marketing. We can see your, your sales improving 20, 25%, depending on the industry as well. Sometimes, I mean, it's the same as consulting. You don't expect a consultant's fee to go in and then expect to see like a huge increase in projects. Also, it is not, not the case for every, every single um, uh, client. But I always tell my clients, look, whatever I'm recommending you, is it's this way because I don't think that everything applies to you. Right? Like not every hawker center store need to have a LinkedIn. Right? No one will go and find you there on LinkedIn. You better be on the other platforms that make sense to you. Then why are yeah. you spending? And some companies also we realize because Singapore has this problem, right? A lot of our companies, hey, what's your marketing budget? Huh? I don't know. Lah. Anything one. What is anything? So when they have this anything mentality, then when they realize how much they were actually spending at the end of the year, hey, wow, a lot. Huh? I say, yeah, you realize now, right? So this is what branding is supposed to help you do. It's supposed to help to refocus, right? And make sure that your marketing dollars are spent properly because you're messaging properly, right? But tangible, like I said, I cannot, there's, there's no number. I cannot tell you whether people increase sales by 50%, 25%. I ha- do I have clients who suddenly improve by 25, 30%? Yes, I do. Do I have clients who make improvements from the 5%, 10%? Yes, also. But also, you know, clients also come from a very, very wide range of, of, of industries, all at different sizes. But the one thing that I always want to make it clear to them, I say, look, I'm your, your consultant here. I'm not here, right, to make you feel good. I'm not a joint that you get high on, but I'm here to sometimes <laughs> just give you a little bit of a slap and a big dose of reality. That is what I'm supposed to be doing. And if you have, and if you if you have a consultant for me, lah, huh, if a consultant agrees too much with his client, something is wrong somewhere. Yeah. You know, for us, it's really yeah. that's why I love being the devil's advocate, right? Because that is our job. We have to always look at them. Hmm, are you sure that will work? And then we dig, 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 dig. You know, and and it's that openness to really. Um, allow you know that's why for 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 my side right when we are doing consulting work we leave no stone unturned because your problems you might be thinking is just oh we are not doing digital marketing but then after that doing interviews i say i think you have a much bigger problem than that i think more than 70 percent of your teams are ready to walk out on you you know then what happens with all your great strategies that put in place you don't have a team to fix it so every company is different it's not there's no guarantee that everyone who goes onto digital marketing is going to, to, to be successful. That is not the case, right? You might, you might be able to get the inquiry, perhaps get a sale, but you know, at the end of the day, if it's a shit product, it's a shit product. You cannot, again, this is something that I told Carrie, you cannot put lipstick and a wig on a pig and think that the pig is something else. It is still a pig, right? You yes. cannot change that. So for me, it's, and, it's, it's like this. And John is 100% right. Because yes, if you... Will always if, be pigs. 100% right. Pigs will always be pigs. And that's the scary part, right? People will go, I need digital marketing. Can, can you come in and help them? Uh, can you come in and help us? And I will go in. I will try the product. I will buy the product. If it's uh, uh, female oriented, I'll, I'll pay people, I'll give them money to go in and try it. And then after that, when people come out and they say, well, the product is not very good. Service is not very good. And you go back and you tell the business owner, listen, there's something wrong with the product. There's something wrong with the end result. And I'm willing to bet that if you reverse engineer everything, there's something wrong with the company as well. And they will go, no, 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 I just need more awareness. I just need more marketing. I just need more branding. And then you start to talk to the people at the back. You start to talk to the operations staff. You start to, talk, start to talk to the manager. Then you find out, hey, this manager just came in three months ago. And then you find out that, oh, there were three or four managers before this. <laughs> and then you find out that, you know, and then you find out, you find out, you find out, you go, oh, your organization has a much bigger problem. These are the problems. You got to fix these things first. Then your end product will work. Yeah. And sometimes, of course, the, the product is just not viable. Right? And that's yeah. another story. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's why it's so difficult for me and Kenneth to, to be able to share every single bit. And that's why I summed it, I summed it up as, you know, branding is really everything about your company because mm. to really dwell and go deeply, you know, uh, into every single aspect of what branding is. Uh, well, those, that's why I think we started the podcast because we couldn't address everything yeah. in, one, yeah. in one episode. It's a constant thing, you know, and it's changing. You know, same thing like I talk about the vision and uh, uh, your vision at the, at the beginning 
you know, those things are, and I, I and I'm, and I always ask them, look, when did you start your vision? Right? Uh, is it the same, same today? Oh, okay. Then tell me, how far are you from achieving this vision of yours? If you are nowhere near that, right, still after 20 years, something is wrong. If you've not put in the proper investments and still kept this same vision at the end of the day, then I think you need to relook at your business or relook at leadership of the company, you know? So this is something that I always ask them. Oh, very nice, huh? your vision, huh? to be the number one, for example, pain distributor in Asia. So how many markets are you in now? Uh, so you've been around for 20 years, right? So how many markets are you in? Oh, Singapore and Malaysia only. So, so in these 20 years, what the fuck was your leadership doing? You know, have you attempted to go into other markets? Uh, no, not really. Felt like not really. Then that's a really huge vision. And, and that's why, right, they, they keep on looking at the big, you know, how, how, how in the West they, they do things. I think that's where the difference comes in sometimes in the West. They, 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 they talk about it, but they go and do it. Whether it's a shit product or whatever, they'll still try and do it. Right? For us, it's like, no lah. So I, 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 I give these kind of things, right? But I, I don't think I will have the confidence to, to, to put my money where my mouth is. You know, so they, they follow and then they can't do it. So that's where the confidence drops off at the same time. Right? They just, they, even they are not 100% convinced by what they are offering. I think that's where the problem is also. Trying to be like too, too much like someone else and forgetting that we are here and it's a totally different culture here. I forgot. Yeah. Mm. I, think, I think the, as a Gary Vaynerchuk super fan, <laughs> I think the phrase was John is shaking his fucking head because I like, can't deal with this. But like I think one of the key phrases that I, I, I really like is don't do things hard. Like don't be half pregnant about it. Don't do things half pregnant. Right? You 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 are either all in or you're not. You gotta you believe in your product, you gotta go, you gotta do it. Uh, a lot of companies don't. And yeah. there's always some kind of reservation. I also noticed that like Companies with like leadership or founders that listen, that um, that that are willing to sort of take your feedback and take the honesty that we are giving. They their companies are also companies that tend to do better, not because we gave them any solutions, but just because of the nature of the fact that they are more willing to listen and they are more willing to take in different perspectives. Yeah. Um, we often get this whole, and I often get this whole, like startup founder tunnel vision, right? Where they mistake being, they mistake having, uh, having tunnel vision for having a singular objective and vision. So they end up cutting everyone out. And it's a very real system where they go, I believe in my product. My product is good. It's the best. I can do it. We can do it. It's just, you, you don't understand it. You don't get it. And if you tell, uh, able to tell one person that only, that, that I still get it. But if everyone doesn't get it, then maybe your product isn't really that great. Right? Yeah. And just a few, a few words to add on to Ken this one. And I, and we, I said this also in our intro about our podcast, why we're doing it. Everyone says, Gary V this, Gary V that. <laughs> <laughs> Philip Kotler this, Philip Kotler that, Anthony Robbins this, Anthony Robbins that, all, oh, yeah, I say fine and dandy. But what have they said that you have actually applied what you are doing? Because everyone can give you a lot of advice, but what are you exactly doing with it? And then if you, at the end of the day, you just say, no lah, not relevant. I like them. I like them, but it's not relevant because we all are Asia. Then that means you're not doing anything about it. So everyone is, you know, you know, you know the, what, the, what they call an ask hole, right? Yeah, it's the same thing. Right? You get, take, ask so many damn questions, so many things, but at the end of the day, right? You're not doing anything with the info that you're given. And that is, I think that is the, one of the greatest, greatest sins. <laughs> got it, got it. I, I, can I just follow up on one point, right? You talk about business, businesses being open to ideas, your potential clients, they are being open to ideas, right? I'm just curious from your perspective. I know that like just in a short period of time, just talking to you guys, that you guys are very direct. You tell people what they need and not what they want to hear. I have the assumption that you guys don't accept any kind of clients that all, all types of clients. You, choo you carefully choose your clients and know who you can really, really help. So I'm just, could you share more about how you qualify your clients? in terms of whether they can take that candorous opinion from you where it may hurt sometimes. 
Um, so for me, I mean, we, we also have an SEO engine working and things like that. And people do make a lot of inquiries uh, to us. Sometimes for us, we, at the same time, I don't want to judge whoever I'm speaking to, right? As much as I don't want the person to be judging us so quickly as well. But for, for in terms of, uh, I mean, prospecting, yeah, we have the engine, so that's that, right? But in terms of how we actually go into what I actually talk to the client about, and, and I always say this to, to, to every client, I say, look, this is how we look at things, right? If uh, we are not just about your logos and whatever, if, if, if it's a logo and website that you want, then, you know, I've told this to people before and then we are not the right ones to go because we are very concerned about other aspects of your business. And this is what we are here for and this is why I feel our strengths because design, yeah, it's very subjective, right? Someone might find it nice, others might find it not. But I, I said, I'm going to find out for you whatever your problems are. And if you give me the permission, I will dig and I'll make sure I unearth a lot of problems. I tell them that. So those who are brave enough, right? They say, okay. And I've done all the way. And I found out many, many internal issues with them. And yeah, which, which required basically a company to be restructured also at the same time, you know? So for me, it's always at that point where, of course, where I, I cannot just go out with all guns blazing. And because we have a culture, which I'm also very aware of, that people, especially bosses, don't like to hear that they are in the wrong. And then after that, I will get this young man. How old are you? 36. Uh. Uncle here, 70 already. You know, I've been doing business since before you were born. You know, I'll get that. I get that. You know, Even though I, I look old, right? But I get that. But it's always the point of, okay, I will assure them. I say, look, you come with me and I will make sure that I find this out. But you have to accept that I, I'm a straight talker and I will say it as it is. Because I feel that it's my duty as your consultant. I said, the longer I take you, you know, dancing around rose bushes and stuff like that, the longer it is to fix the problem. And this is what I tell, I tell my clients. I say, I have to be very open with you. I have to be, and I'm very direct. Yeah. And I, I have some clients who even like, no problem. My, my, you know, my internal culture is no problem. And then I find out that it's in the shits. And then I have to confront. And then some people would say, no, like you go easy on the boss. Don't do that. I said, no, then he doesn't learn anything. So I said, look, this is, this is exactly the problem. And for me, it's, it's always like that. I have to, and again, going back to the point of the skill and, and, and the proving of, of the experience, this is where I have to basically earn my keep to also prove why I'm worthy also to my client that I can give the experience. I might be a, you know, a straight talker and all that, but you know, at the same time, I also have to be very understanding of these people who are running the brand. It is their brand, something that they, that they have babied for a long time. But I'm here also to, to, you know, I'm that bitter pill, a very, very big and bitter pill to swallow, you know, the, this, this pill of reality, which I bring during the course of, of a consulting job. Do I have some clients who really halfway, I feel that, oh my God, I better, I, I should not have done this project with them. Yeah, of course. Too late to pull out. Yes, there are clients like this, but there are also, there are cl some clients at the starting point, which I said, who are not interested in finding out, but only interested in their, in their logo and website. And I would say, okay. Uh, and I, my, my, my reply to them is very, very simple. Either on email or the phone, I say, look, we are not that kind of company. Uh, we are focusing a lot on strategy, you know, and how your company will do for the future. Then if I hear the, oh, okay, so y'all don't do like I said, no, I better you go and go to another company and find them. I don't have the, the capacity to work on these kind of things. And I will tell them straight. Yeah, because for me, doing that kind of thing just to beautify you, again, putting the, pic, putting the lipstick and, and wig on you is not good enough for me as a, as a consultant. If I, I, if I don't find out what drives you, what's you, I'd rather not do it. Even if you're paying me like, what, five, ten grand to do that kind of thing, I said, go and find on Fiverr. It might be actually better for you. Right. Yeah, that's my I think, I think like, John is right. And I think on my, on my end also, because I... I do my work and my consulting at night. And then I actually realized that I do the same work and consulting in the day for my day job as well. And the one thing that really acts as my filter is when I first meet the person, right? And I share about what I do. Uh, I, I really ask them what they think about it. And I also, from their mannerism and the way they speak about their business, because I will always ask them, what do you do? How is the business like? What are you thinking of? And the moment 
I start hearing them speak, uh, we always, like I put it through a filter of, do they understand the brand? Do they understand what branding is asking of them? Right. Uh, and I always have like a power with the people that I work with. And, you know, it's always whether I always ask the people that I work with, do you think after talking to them, do they understand the concept of what branding will take out of them or not? First of all, what does it take? Do they understand? And if the answer is yes across the board, then I start to sort of, okay, let's, let's start to come up with a plan. Let's start to work with them. Let's, let's really start to have a conversation and phone call and face to face, even though now you can't do face to face, Zoom meeting, phone call face to face, have that like engagement. And that's like really the, the way I filter clients or I filter people that come in. And it's the same like on a, on a, I just, I recently had a Zoom call and this person was asked because I do a lot, a lot more of like social media and like brand work for like my, what I do personally, right? And I always ask them, so what is it you want to achieve? And the moment the person eh, 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 ah, 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 and start to throw out like vanity matrix mm-hmm. at me, right? Then I know that I cannot work with them like this. So at the same time, it's also a very big, painful balance, right? Because you also need to eat. I think John has this same right, concept, right? Like we also need to take on clients. Sometimes you take on clients that you know can be teachable and even though they may not have the set, uh, yeah, right? They may not have the same origin point, but like, you know, okay, this person can have teachable more one, can talk one, then okay, la, like, I, will, I will try it. Uh, and, in, and in my opinion, a lot of times that allows me to make past friends or something. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. It always remind me of this one client of mine and he was always so concerned, especially like, uh, like I said, he was, he was so confident that his internal culture was strong and good because he has a lot of pep talk with the team. But when he found out that it was not, and he really had to swallow all these pills because you know the ego, the pride had been hurt. But I knew that he was hurt. But the thing is, after that, he found all the time, right? And whenever he could, we would just talk, you know, and chit chat about the situation, how we could fix things to allay his fears. And we talked, you know, an hour, an hour and a half kind of thing sometimes on a weekly basis, you know, but this is where I, I truly respect that boss, you know, where he's willing to put aside his, his, his wounded pride, you know, and, and work on, on keeping the company together. Of course, every company wants to make money. They should be making money. Or else why the hell are you existing also, right? But he's also concerned about the kind of product he was bringing out to his clients and concerned about how his team were functioning together. Because he was like, wow, if, if the situation is so bad, then wow, I, I really have to step in as a boss to, to, to heal these, these, these wounds that have, been, you know, that have been deepening over time. You know? So I, I respect fully this kind of boss, you know, the traditional mindset one, but who was still willing to put those things aside in order to change and do what's best for his company. And I really respect, and I learned a lot also from this client at the same time. I must imagine mm. the satisfaction that you can... It makes you feel happy, I'm sure, as a brand consultant to know that you're making those changes and people are receptive to it. On, on that note, right, let's say I'm just interested to get your general thoughts in terms of the best advice that you have had in the agency world. Because I think like in a brand consultant-ish, uh, it's, a, it's like a hashtag, it's an agency life in a sense. You're, you're all, you always have clients that you are serving. So in terms of the advices that you could give to, let's say, early brand consultants, early in their journey in terms of servicing clients, um, is, is there any golden wisdom of nuggets that you could share ah, in terms of dealing okay. with clients? Wow. For me, I think because sometimes when you have this tag of consultant, you know, you start walking, some people walk around with a chip on their shoulder. <laughs> and for this kind of people, I like, to, I like to shoot them from far and bring oh. them down very, very quickly. I think you have to be very humble, but confident. You know, humble, uh, confident doesn't mean cocky. Don't be cocky. You'll be ripped apart by the people whom you are trying to serve. Always be open to listen. And listening is such a key thing about being a consultant. You are there. I always tell people we are, you know, like kind of like doctors, uh, shrinks all at the same time, you know, and, and different 
facets of this could come up depending on the the thing. But yeah, for me, it's really just be humble, be willing to to learn, and always be willing to ask as well. Don't ask stupid questions. You know? Always watch out for that. People will call you out also, and your integrity comes into question as well. Don't go into uh, a project blind. Always do your homework and try to find out every single detail that you can drag from the internet. You know, stalk them, stalk your potential clients on LinkedIn. You know, find out, find out as much information. Information is power. Information is key when it comes to consulting us. How are you going to try to advise this company if you are not willing to learn and listen at the first point? Yeah, for me, this is uh, from a while, wise old age of 36. Uh, <laughs> this is what's come out. <laughs> I'm really close to John in terms of age, uh, and my time in the in agency has like maybe taught me only a, like I feel like only a few things. And uh, first one is don't drink your own cool, don't drink the Kool Aid, and two, uh, don't be a long range warrior. Um, the first one, yeah, right? The first one really to me is like sometimes you know agency right got. The whole agency got chip on the shoulder one. Okay. Don't buy into the agency's chip on the shoulder. Don't always listen to the agency leader and what they tell you. Ask yourself, is this, is this really what will benefit the client? Is this what will benefit the agency in the long run? Long run. And then is this what will benefit my career? Yes. Take the action no matter how unorthodox or unwelcome it is. Be able to explain yourself, right? Be ready. Whether your, your greatest weapon is your slight back or your mouth, I don't care. Have a, like, make sure you have a weapon of choice. And make sure you are able to wield it well. Uh, you can prove a lot of points with that. Uh, your, your courage is very important, especially when you're going, to, uh, going against the grain. And if you are the kind of person that questions things, you will go against the grain a lot and be willing to take the risk. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Just find another job, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I think the, the other one is don't be a long-range warrior. For me, being a long-range warrior, and I have worked with many agencies, long-range warrior means, I sent the email already, he didn't, he didn't reply. So that's a job done. I don't know. Uh, I texted him already. I, 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 sent, I sent him a message already in whatever form, right? Like, yeah. You can have all the data, like you can buy data, you can draw data out from analytics, whatever. I, I don't care. But in my opinion, nothing beats like human interaction. Yes. Nothing beats human interaction, whether it's by call or by a very personal WhatsApp message to ask people what's going on, or by meeting them face to face, or doing a WhatsApp video, I, I, I don't care. That face to face, right? And asking questions, being willing to be curious and inquisitive when you have your face to face, will yield you more results that you can marry with the data. Like John talks about knowing everything you can. This is part of it. When you can weaponize questions, uh, you know, to gain more knowledge about the person, the business that you're working with, it's, it's tremendously powerful. When you talk about weaponizing questions, right, could you elaborate on that? No, as in like, I understand that it's really about crafting good questions that evoke the response that is necessary. Can we elaborate more on weaponizing questions? Because I think it's very important to ask good questions. How do you ask good questions? So like asking good questions would mean that like you are trying to seek at the start, asking good questions might be, I'm trying to seek a context to the whole situation. So you should be probing on like what the business situation is, the internal business situation, right? And then you are matching it to the outside environment or what you are reading. Mm. Because there's someone that there's no, it doesn't make sense one, you know, like in some, in some cases, the whole industry is doing well, but this company is like falling apart. So why? 
So you have to ask them. And that's when you start to drill down, right? Start to talk about like, you know, you have like five different products. So what, what are, what do, what is the purpose of all these products? What's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of that? So you are like trying to build context. Then people, people who like are sharp enough, they will know, oh, this fella actually, he's trying to understand the whole story, right? The probing is not to like attack them. The probing is to really understand the situation. This whole like weaponizing questions, right? People often mistake it for, oh, he's asking questions, right? To, to expose my weak point, then he will attack me later on. So weaponizing questions is really about getting the knowledge, not, not about playing politics. So once you understand the context, then you start to ask about really the micro details. So ask questions that to knowledgeable people about the, the performance of the product. Mm. So, uh, so you have like three different kinds of baguette, right? Why, why is it that this particular baguette is doing very well? Why? Uh? Why? Or why is it that this particular um, dish, right? Nobody order. Like, do you, do you have feedback from your customer? Why? Like, and some of these questions invariably will piss people off. Yeah. Guaranteed. Then, of course, you fall back on explaining that, look, what I'm trying to understand is why you are doing so badly when the rest of the industry is doing so well. <laughs> right? In, in a gentle, loving way, uh, a lot of times, and this, is, this has been like recurring in a lot of the conversations that John and I have been having and, and actually conversations with my friends is that like, if you come from a place of I care about your business and these questions help me understand your business better, then a lot of times people will open up. Then suddenly, right, it feels like you are the founder's best friend. Right? They will start to omit all their problems out to you. Yes. Ah, that no, just to, or to add on to Kenneth, right? It's really also the important thing is that that, that sensitivity from the point of the consultant and mm. the awareness of situations. Because some things that I picked out about a company, right, was down to my interactions with the boss and some of his key figures. And for me, it's really even noticing how people are interacting with each other within a team setting, right? which has allowed me to pry open the deepest, darkest secrets you know, of a company. Yeah. And I think that is so important because the inquisitive nature cannot be, why are that? Ah? Why are that? That one is very, very on the surface kind of. But what yeah. me and Kenneth are trying to, to drive at, right, is really the sensitivity to understand why something might be functioning in a certain way first. Being aware, okay? And then after that, going on with the question in order to confirm our suspicions All and right. to Further. And, yeah. and sometimes the question, the answer to the question might surprise you. And then you're like, oh, so this is yeah. why the data was saying right. this. So you are trying to marry like what you already know with the unknown, the tangible with the intangible, and just like merging them together and understanding the entire picture. And this takes time. And so, you know, it's, it's not on the first call, it's maybe on the third call or the fifth call, right? And all the while you're just working towards understanding. Yeah. What are the holes in the system? Mm. Who, who are the bright spots in the system? What is the saving grace? What is the winning factor? And then you're like, okay, this is good, this is good, this is good. Yeah. This is not good, this is not good. But all these things can cover. All these things can support. All right, you, you've got something that's workable here. Let's talk about that. Mm. That's how I, I approach it. Of course, there are some times where you, you, I have to go back and go, if you want to save this business, <laughs> we, we got to get rid of some things, you know? Uh, those are always very hard conversations. But the weaponized questions that you have used earlier on, build the rapport between you and the founder, you and the owner. And then when you tell them the, the very painful truth with empathy, and respect for the business and their love for the business, I, a lot of times they will go, okay, yeah, I get it. Now, whether they act on it or not is another story. But uh, I think honesty, some the brutal honesty sometimes is, like people will mistake uh, the term brutal honesty for lack of respect, and that's just not true. 
I, I like how the point that you talk about sensitivity. So when you talk about sensitivity and about really prying or let's say inferring so much from just the interactions between the teams, right? It, it, reminds, it reminds me, I think this is like a special specialty that at least you guys have of knowing that Asian context. And I think that like, as, not, to say like, not, to, not to be like Asians or Westerners, like, because I just think about, let's say my short experience when I actually went to New York in Vayner and it, you actually see the culture there, right? It's so different. I can, one thing I must say that Vayner Media is a very American <laughs> company. It's a very American yeah. company. Then when, when, when I hear you talk about this sensitivity in, let's say SME clients, right? I really think that it's a special power la, in a sense because I can almost guarantee that someone a brand consultant ish right from the West wouldn't be able to pry out these contacts within. So I think that's a very insightful Asian perspective on that note. What's the worst piece of advices have you ever gotten in terms of this journey as being in the branding world, branding consultancy world? Oh, okay. The worst one. <sighs> That's a lot, but I think the I think the worst one that I've ever heard. Oh uh, very easy. Like I mean, I, okay. Are you saying from a point of uh, like uh, what I've heard through my journey as a consultant or or what? In general, the agency okay. life, the, ugly, ah, okay. the ugliest okay. things that you have seen or heard. Hmm. Wow, well, I've got a, quite a few. Let me just <laughs> <laughs> kind of start thinking. Already I mean, right it, now. it can be the top three or top four because I'm just <laughs> curious to know because obviously you guys have so much experience. I'm just like. I'm very fascinated by this uh, concept of storytelling. So I'm sure you guys have so much stories that are, that, that where lessons can be learned from. So I'm just really interested to hear from your perspective in terms of the worst things like, oh, what the shit is this guy or this industry is happening? Why, why is it like that? Like something that is like, you feel that isn't right. And that's why I want to be able to share this kind of message uh, with whoever is listening in this journey of, let's say if he or she is entering the agency space, perhaps he or she shouldn't be affected by these worst practices, worst advices, toxic things about ah, the industry? I think for me, the worst, the worst one, and for me, I, I make sure that this doesn't happen at my side, that uh, to treat what I've heard before, how other people I know from other companies, I'm not going to mention which ones, nah, but they say, oh, uh, no, nah, we just do the same, uh, just standard one. Nah. <laughs> oh, my standard one. <laughs> yeah, do the standard thing. Cutter project for clients. I said, huh? But how 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 is that possible? You know, all our clients are so different, and and they could be from the same industry, but the each organization is so unique. No, but my 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 boss say just uh, faster do lah. Just close the project in 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 a couple of months. Huh? Really? Cookie cutter. I mean, I'm sure we all have templates that we work on, but we don't cookie cutter the questions and everything. Everything is driven, you know, for, 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 for me, right? I mean, for us, when we do business, I say, I always tell people, look, there are some things that might happen that I might have to fix, but don't worry, I won't charge you because it's so difficult to see everything that's wrong with you. I'm not like a doctor that I can send you for all the different scans and then you pay for it. Nobody's going to do that. So I have to fix those, those problems. So, but there's no cookie cutter solution for me because I I work so much on this feel and connection and, and sensitivity part that for me to hear the word cookie cutter, I I just cannot for me it's the worst. I think the worst thing for any consultant to to do is that there is a, a okay a chop 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 templated format for every single damn thing. There is no such thing. And that's the for me, I I wow, that is that really riles me to the the high heavens. And that's why for our site, clients ask, why you spend so much time on research uh, talking to my this one, talking to that one? Uh, and I said, then after at the end of it, of that phase, I said, look, worth it, not worth it, right? Yeah, 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 worth it. You know? <laughs> but if you are cook, going to cookie cutter all the way, right, you will never find out these issues. And that means you're only fixing, uh, you're putting the lipstick and the wig again. Yeah. Mm. So for me, it has something to do with like lipstick and the wig. Uh, but this is real advice that I've heard from people uh, in my early years of working in agency. They look me in the eye and go, Kenneth, look, you don't know a lot of things. So just fake it till you make it. <laughs> just fake it till you make it. Yeah. You'll be fine. And to me, that was really bad advice because I took it for a while. I took it. I took it and I ran before and I realized, no, no, if you are 
if you're out of your depth, you're out of your depth, you better go and learn. Don't, and I, I, as someone like now who is a senior, right? Like, I will never give that piece of advice to anyone. Do, do not. In fact, the opposite piece of advice will come. Do not fake it till you make it. Don't smoke anyone. You will get caught. You will find out. You will be found out. Someone who is sharp will pick you apart real fast. Yeah. And I'm lucky that no one picked me apart when I was faking it till I make it. Right? And I, I dropped it the moment I realized that, nope, I'm out of my depth. I need to go and learn. Yes. Conversely, go and learn. Uh, go and like pick you know, up yeah. skills. Uh. Yeah, go and talk to people. Go and read. Like, you know, you do a lot of reading. Uh, you are always looking at books and you never have this moment where you use... I, I've watched quite a few of your episodes. You never have this moment where you like come across knowing more than, more than other people. You know, you're like... You never do that. And that's the level of like humility that I really like about you. And it comes from the fact that you don't clearly don't believe in taking it to make it. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think that's why the branding beardos, why we are the way we are, because we are still always learning. Even after yeah. a combine of, you know, almost 20 years in the ex- uh, of experience, right? We're still learning every single day. And that's why yeah. we ran, we go on our rants, we go on our uh, rant, foul mouth tirades. But when we have guests on the show, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's where we also start probing and we start learning from the people who come on yeah. our show. That is the other side. The rant is always the, this is the reality for people who are still yeah. thinking about it. But when we have people with us, we are always in learning mode and we never, never yeah. stop learning and never to proud to say that we know everything yeah in fact like i realized that john and i are, are the same when we have guests on the show we are ultra silent because like we only know what we know and there's like 90 percent of the world we don't know like 99 percent we, we only know our little one percent so when we are talking about like when we are renting or when we are pissed off at something it's because like we have been doing it and we know the nuances and we know the issues and we are super pissed and so we talk about it but when we ask questions, we're completely silent. We shut up and just listen. Uh, and I really, really do believe that you only know all the things you know, but there's like the other 99% that you don't know. It's actually the piece of the puzzle that will help you unlock more shit in life. So it's just, we shut up and listen carefully. All the answers are there. I feel like this is like a, like a, I would say like a consulting session is in a sense it's like it's really just about asking questions, getting the context, and getting to know more information to just understand the other person's yeah. POV. So, a, 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 a podcast, a, a consulting session within a okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like some, <laughs> with something within something. Yeah, it's so meta, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so meta. Okay, yeah, ending, it's, ending, it's, ending of this it's podcast, true. right? I would just like to ask uh, each one of you, right? what are the tangible events that you guys will want to happen within one year that will make it the best lives in your career? Hmm. For me, because I'm running a consulting firm, for me, what will make a success because of what's happening right now, it is really to keep my team, hopefully grow it, right? And not having to, to retrench and, and cut salaries. For me, I'm, I'm taking it one step at a time and that would be success. And of course, for our our podcast to grow and that we can reach out to, to more business owners and not only just here in, in Singapore, but you know, we, we've already done a cross border podcast already with the doctor slash businessman from Malaysia. So we are becoming international, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, um, for me, I, I, I always believe in, we, we make good plans, but uh, to ensure those, those good plans are achieved, you know, we, we try to live every day as best as possible. Yeah, that will, that's for me. I think I've always um, searched for meaning in everything I do. So for me, in my day job, I hope that I can touch, be able to, through what I do, right? It's always my objective. Touch more people's lives positively in everything we do, in every act that we do, whether it's a brand activity or not. And I, I, I actually have the same, same hope for the Branding Beardos podcast. If I can affect more than one person in a positive way, 
whether it's like to help them like improve their career, improve their company, you know, by listening to the podcast. Yeah, I think I will achieve my goal for the year already. <laughs> yeah, I, li- I like the point of how you say that it really, as long as that there's w- even at least one person or even more, or like, it's like, it's like a, how do you say, it's like a in, in inf- infinity time continuum, like your, the conversation that you have <laughs> yeah. might probably be her yeah. 10 years later, yes. five years later, or even just tomorrow, right? Yes. And that is the reason yes. why I'm also doing what I'm doing. I'm really just hoping that, because as an undergraduate, when I was back in my schooling days, I felt that there wasn't really sufficient marketing materials in terms of talking with industry practitioners. I mean, occasionally you do have people coming in, to, in the classrooms and share, but in that sense, like when people are coming in, then they are sharing that, that, that politically right angle. And I'm just, no. I, I prefer to have like that, informal real talk and that's the reason why I'm really doing this I have to really connect with people who are working and I really hope that or at least like for my LinkedIn right that, that my target audience you'll see are already undergraduates poly students that are still figuring it out because I'm still figuring out in a sense so that's also one of the reasons that I resonate why you guys are doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing right so on that note right is for any listeners out there that are interested to reach out to you, how, how can they reach out to you if they have more questions? I'll be linking your podcast um, link in the description. Everything, the link, everything will be in the video description. But if there are people interested to reach out to you, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, you can reach out to us on, uh, on our email. That's uh, thebrandingbeardos at gmail.com. You can just drop us an email and we'll be more than happy to get in touch with you and have a conversation with you. And if you like like private message, uh, I'm always on, on social media. I I love uh, being on Instagram. So you know, at five, the number five, meanders uh, on Instagram, and just drop me a DM, and you know, I can pull John into the conversation and we can have a talk. Um, I love just talking to people. Uh, it doesn't have to go anywhere. You know, you don't have to have like business before we talk to you we don't have to even if it's just like talk like talk talk, talk advice yeah yeah i think now we, we are in that time of our history you know even more we have to be there to to, to help each other you know yeah. um without expecting anything but of course i don't expect us to go and do a full full scale branding <laughs> project for you for free huh? yeah that is the yeah. Famous, huh? Please, huh? <laughs> Got it. Thanks so much for joining this podcast and yeah, hope to see you in the next one. I'll be linking all your LinkedIn, Instagram, Gmails down the video podcast and yeah, hope to see you soon on this podcast. Thanks for having us. No, thanks for coming on, man. So interesting to be on this side of the mic. Really happy to be on the other end also, you know. Okay. Thank you so much.